Hello and welcome to Tonight at 8. As you may know, the RSGB recently ran a special poll to run, find out what new and returning licensees would most like to see a webinar about. And antennas was one of the most popular requests. So tonight we're very pleased to welcome Colin Summers, MM0 OPX, who's going to tell us about the EndFed Halfwave, an antenna which is relatively easy to make, yet can be very versatile and effective. Welcome to Tonight at 8, Colin. Can you give us a quick preview of what you'll be showing us this evening? Hi, David. Hi, everyone. Yep, so tonight, as you say, I'm going to be giving an overview on the NFED half-wave antenna. So for HF, so generally speaking, 40 metres up, uh, I'm going to talk about um, the basic components and I'm also going to talk about the, the transformer in a little bit of detail. Sounds wonderful. Thank you, Colin. Well, before your presentation, a reminder that if you're watching this on Monday, the 6th of November, then this is live and you can ask questions and make comments on either YouTube chat or BATC messaging at any time during the presentation or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and call sign if you have one within every message. And note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or pressing the full screen button. So now, back to Colin to learn all about the EndFed Halfwave antenna. Thank you, David. So, we'll start with our, uh, our contents page. So, I'm going to talk a little, a brief little bit about me, uh, my history uh, in, in amateur radio and my uh, personal life. Um, and then I'm going to give a basic overview of the multiband HF uh, EndFed Halfwave antenna. And generally, I'm going to be speaking about um, bands 40 metres through 10 metres, although I do mention 80 metres a couple of times. Um, I'm going to talk about the EndFed Halfwave um, component descriptions and selections, so I'll give you a little idea. Um, you may not know, but I'm really into yeah. build things, so I would encourage anyone to do that. So I'm going to give some hints and tips there. Um, and then I'm going to dive uh, quite uh, a little bit into testing NFED half-wave transformer efficiency. And this was the primary reason um, why I actually got into NFED half-waves. And then once we've done that, uh, from that testing, I'm going to talk about some alternative NFED half-wave cores. And after that, if you've got any questions for me, hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Okay, so uh, I am 41 years old. Um, I live in a small town in West Lothian, just outside Livingston. So it's junction three of the M8. Um, in my day job, I'm a lead manufacturing engineer. Um, I've worked here all my working life, 25 years, and uh, we make manif we make uh, hydraulic drives. Um, quite an interesting, wide, varied job. Um, and obviously, manufacturing, I get to uh, I, I, get, I get to see all all types of manufacturing. It also helps me within the, within the hobby. Um, I was first licensed in 2011 as MM6 NLC. Um, all of a sudden, I discovered the um, three-tier system because I'd been away from radio for a little while, um, but I got the bug then, so I quickly progressed, got my um, uh, intermediate, and by the November, I had my uh, full license and call of MM0 OPX. I do have lots of other hobbies, um, which include fishing, playing the guitar, but amateur radio for the last four or five years uh, has been my main hobby. It's I think it's that good that... Um, there's there's so much to amateur radio um, that we're always learning something new, and I have no RF or uh, electronics knowledge. So basically, what I'm going to show you tonight. So if I've been able to do this, um, you know, any of you can do that too. Okay, so the end fed halfway. So just. A very brief overview. Um, so it's not a new antenna, and from the, the, the little bit of research that I've done, it, it was actually first patented in 1909 by Hans Bagarow uh, in Germany, and that was known as the NFED ZEP, um, and ZEP was short for Zeppelin. So um, if you know your history, you know what happened to the Hindenburg. Um, but you know, uh, the antenna is usually multi banded. Although mono band versions do exist, I actually have one some here uh, in the garage here. But we're going to talk about mono bands tonight. Um, on the mono, on these mono band versions, we use a toroidal transformer, uh, and that lets us use multiple bands with one single wire. Um, no radials are required for this antenna, which is a big benefit over, say, a ground-mounted vertical. 
um, and typically uh, no tuner or matching is required for the harmonically uh, related bands. So before we get into the, the NFED half wave, I just want to actually just basically look at a dipole. So when we talk about a half wave, um, an NFED half wave and a dipole fundamentally are not that different. All that we're doing is we're feeding, so we're putting our coax to a different bit of the wire. But the, the radiation of the pattern, so where your signals are going to go is going to be effectively the same if you want to look at it in simple terms. But this is a half wave dipole and on any antenna we have voltage and we have current. As you can see here with the dotted line and this solid line here. So this is obviously just representative of a, a half wavelength. And uh, if you know any maths at all, you know that's basically like half of the sine wave. Okay, so taking that a little bit further, um, these very basic drawings here, sketches. So looking at the top here, if we have a dipole, so hopefully most of us know what a dipole is that, that we learn this when we do our foundation license. So uh, we take a half length piece of wire for a given frequency. Uh, we feed it in the middle, so we put one half of the wire to the centre of the coax, the other half to the shield, and we have a dipole, and it's a very good antenna. Typically, it has a, a, an impedance of round about 70 ohms, but for us using 50 ohm, ohm coax, that's close enough that we, we can usually get a match. Um, taking that the next step down, we've got in the middle here, we've got an off-centre fed dipole. This is another favourite of mine. So if we take that feed point and we just put it off, so off, off center as it says. So if we put that one third of the way up, we have an impedance roughly 200 ohms. And we can basically feed that with a four to one ballot. And that's actually going to give us a multiband antenna. Uh, I've used this and typically say you make it for 40 meters, you would get uh, 40, 20, 10. Sometimes you may get 15, but 15 could be a bit funny. Then taking that uh, further again, uh, if we feed this same piece of wire, but we feed it at either end, we've then got our, our end fed. Now, the impedance here will vary. I, it, it will be round about two and a half, three thousand 3,000 ohms. Um, and then this is where you see people using a 49 to 1, 56 to 1, 64 to 1 transformer because we can't just hook up our coax. So we need to transform that impedance down to something that our uh, a radio uh, will be happy with. So I think the main convenience for the NFED half wave is the fact is that it's a multiband antenna makes it very, very convenient and uh, humans in general will always take the easy, convenient option. And I think this is why the NFED is so popular. So, um, as I said, we're going to be talking about, generally speaking, because my experience with NFED half waves has been um, from 40 metres through 10, but um, yeah, we'll say we'll touch on 80. So for 66 foot of wire or 21 metres approximately, and we can have an antenna that will cover 40, 20, 15, and 10. Um, if we double that length of wire, um, we then would get 80, uh, sorry, yeah, 80, 30, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10, because these are all harmonically uh, related bands. So uh, you may think that, great, I only need one wire, so uh, that's going to cover all the bands. And some people do that, but there is some, some, disadvantages, some disadvantages to that. We'll cover, we'll cover that in a little bit. So the basic uh, NFED half wave uh, antenna setup. So this is about as simple as it gets to try and uh, explain it. So this blue, big blue box in the middle is our transformer. So that's our 49 to 1, uh, our 64 to 1. Um, so coming from that, we would have our antenna wire here on the right. So this would be a half wavelength for the lowest frequency that we, we would intend to uh, use. So, uh, for example, we would use, you know, that 21 meters or 66 foot of wire, which gives us that half wave. Now, uh, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit here, but I've put them in for because this is very good housekeeping here. Um, normally, a um, NFED half wave will have a connection for a counterpoise. Um, and I'll put my hand up and, and be honest that... Um, <laughs> I never actually used this. I used it in some testing, but generally, if I'm operating portable, I found that I don't need to. 
So your counterpoise, it, 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 it can help with uh, basically think about it almost like radials, um, but using a, this small counterpoise wire instead. Now, this only needs to be 5% of a wavelength at your lowest operating frequency. So that's two meters on 40 meters. So it doesn't need to be very long. And this helps to stop something called common mode um, or uh, flowing down the shield of the coax and going back to your uh, shack and your radio and, and giving some issues. So from the transformer, we can see that there's another short piece of coax. Um, and you, you, you need to put the, basically, you need to put the choke, which I'm going to talk about next, you need to put that a little bit further away from the transformer. Um, I actually read this, Steve Ellington's done a lot of work on the NFED half wave, and I've actually done these experiments uh, myself. So you basically, again, you put a 5% uh, or 0 0.05 length of uh, coax, so that would be two, two meters uh, on 40 meters, a little bit of coax before you get to your choke. So I'll, I'll tell you just a quick little story about this. Usually I don't use a choke, so I connected my uh, coax up to my transformer. Um, I trimmed the antenna, the wire for lowest SWR and all was great. And I decided to actually add a choke right at the transformer. And it actually changed where my SWR dip was. Um, so I knew that the choke was affecting it. I then put in this little jumper of coax and then the wire, uh, the SWR went back to where it was originally. So uh, it's just a little tip because I see some people saying you put your choke right at the transformer, but don't put it a little bit further away. That's just a, just a, a, an idea. It doesn't need to be exactly 5% uh, of a wavelength, but if it's round about that, it'll be okay. And then from your choke, we want a length of coax back to your radio, and that, that can be any length. But of course, you want to keep that as, as short as possible, uh, just to minimise losses. So while we're talking about chokes, um, it's not certainly not my specialised subject here, um, but um, these are basically the, the, the two, um, I would say, the two gurus when it comes to common mode chokes. So a G3TXQ and GM3SEK. And the chokes that I use are actually the GM3 SEK chokes. They use these little funny shaped cores, I don't know what you would call that, almost oval. Um, and basically, these three chokes here cover basically low bands, mid bands, and the higher bands, so uh, 160 through 10 meters. Uh, they're very easy to build. Um, so, you know, I would certainly recommend that. But I'm not an expert on chokes, but there, there's many, many designs out there. And Steve, uh, he actually had, he's done a multitude of experimentation. Uh, and if you, if you if you look it up, you'll, you'll find this little table. Um, and there's many different ways you could actually make a choke. So looking at typical SWR curves of the NFED half wave, um, this is typically what you may see, but it, it probably won't always be. Um, um, just basically depending on maybe your ground conditions, maybe anything that could be interacting with the antenna. But it does give a representation of how you can actually get a nice match, a nice SWR right across the HF spectrum, which again, which is very nice, especially if your radio uh, it doesn't have a, a tuner or an ATU. Um, one of the complaints uh, I hear regularly uh, about the NFED half wave is its performance on the higher bands. Um, and I know quite a few people that's done AB comparisons. So they have two antennas set up for 10 meters, for example, one of them being an NFED half wave and another one being, for example, a, a T2LT um, flower pot antenna or some sort of vertical. And they say that the, the NFED half wave is, is well down, multiple S points down, uh, than the NFED half wave, and that's just what I'm going to explain here. So top left here, you can imagine that if you have a, a half length piece of wire and you have it say half a wavelength from the ground, you get these two lobes, so it's almost bi-directional. If you then feed that same piece of wire with a signal for 20 meters, you could see then we get these four lobes. Um, and again, Three, th three half waves or one and a half wavelengths for 15 meters, you can see that we get even more lobes. But not only do we get these lobes, we get these massive nulls. So if you're getting signals coming in here, they're going to be massively down um, than, than, say, perhaps, you know, uh, what it would be on 40. 
And again, by the time you get to 10 metres, you get even more of these peaks and nulls. So it could be even worse. And certainly that's why I believe that um, performance can suffer. So it's not always the case that more uh, wire in the, in the air is, is always better. There, I think there is a sweet spot when, when it comes to it. So configuration of your uh, NFED half wave. This is just three examples, but the good thing about the NFED half wave is it's quite a tolerant antenna. So uh, you could basically string it up on your chimney, run it about your garden. Um, as long as you've not got too many bends in it, um, I know the general saying is don't make any bend um, more than 90 degrees, but you can go a bit more than that. So again, the inf inverted V, which is typically we would run a normal dipole and have our coax running up the middle, but we'd have our, have our transformers at one end. Um, this, the inverted V is very good. So for us here in the UK, if you have a an NFED half wave inverted V, you will have a very strong signal around the UK uh, and locally around Europe. Excellent for that. Um, running it as an inverted L, so running straight up and straight across, um, that gives you a little bit lower uh, angle of radiation, um, so it's a little bit better for DX. And this dotted line is that's typically how I uh, run it when I'm out portable because it's very difficult to keep that flat top. Um, and another uh, very popular way that I like to do it is basically just run um, as, as a vertical. I actually raise the uh, feed point off the ground a little bit, a couple of metres. I put it on my 12 metre spider beam pole um, and I like running sort of 20 metres up on the antenna um, and it works very, very well. Excuse me, I'll just get a drink of water. So. I briefly said I was just going to touch on 80 metres and it's not something I've got a lot of experience with, but um, credit to G0 uh, KYA for his nice uh, drawing here. So you could have a basically 66 foot end fed half wave and on the end of that you can add a little coil, so a 110 micro Henry coil and beyond that you could add say two, two and a half metres of uh, wire. So this will then work on um, 80, 40, uh, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10. So it just gives you 80 meters. Now, it will be a compromise giving you 80 meters, but uh, any antenna is better than no antenna, uh, as, as the old saying goes. And because it's electrically, electrically the right length for 80 meters, but um, physically it's shorter, you will get a, a narrower bandwidth. Um, I have made a couple of these coils on, on the right hand side here. This is one that I made last year. And you can see that I've almost got it to 110 micro henrys with my little LCR meter here. I used a little on, online calculator and this was actually a doddle to make. So what the coil does is, so for frequencies um, 40 meters up, it basically acts as a choke so it stops any signal going past it. But on 80 meters, it allows the signal to basically go past it and actually then seize the coil. And then it allows you to get a match on 80 meters. So if that's something that you're interested in. Now, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of people like to build their own antennas, but um, then a lot of people just like to buy. And that's perfectly understandable. I, I, I bought antennas myself for, for a long time. And when it comes to the NFED half wave, you've basically got two options. You can either... Um, Buy a buy your just your transformer and put your own wire in it, so you're doing a little bit of yourself, um, or you could just buy actually the whole thing, um, so the transformer, or uh, yeah, and and the wire, um, but even though you, you buy it with a wire, it's highly likely that you may need to do some adjustment uh, on the wire, uh, and that just to your local environment. Um, the ground can have a massive effect on your NFED half wave um, and that's why we want to try and keep it up as high as we, we practically can because that will uh, minimise losses. So as I said, um, why not make your own NFED half wave transformer um, and it's a really good project for the new radio amateur. Um, they, they, they can look complicated but they're not really. Now, um, as I said, we see people talking about a 49 to 1 or a 64 to 1. And a question I see quite a lot is, well, how, how do you actually work out that that's a 49 to 1 or a 64 to 1? 
So I'll, I'll explain it in my speak um, and, and how I look at it, um, and hopefully that's understandable to you. So on the left hand side here, we have a, a, a typical 49 to 1 transformer. So we have two primary windings, which is these uh, coiled wires together here. And then we have uh, 14 secondary windings. Now that's these single wires here, but it's actually also here as well. So the primary and the secondary are actually intertwined. So every time, time the wire goes through the middle of the ferrite core, we count that as one turn. So I'll just count this one up. So there's one turn, two turn. So that's our primary. And then if we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven through the middle, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I've missed one out here somewhere, but there is fourteen there, trust me. <clears throat> so there's fourteen secondary. So if we take fourteen and we divide that by two, that gives us seven. And if we take seven and square it, so seven times seven, that gives us forty-nine, and that's our forty-nine to one. And then on the right hand side here, we have an example of a 64, 64 to 1. So we have three primary and we have 24 secondary. So we take 24, uh, we divide that by 3, which is 8. 8 times 8 is 64. It's a 64 to 1. So um, you could have, say, um, uh, four, four, primary, uh, 4 primary turnings and you could have 28 secondary. So 28 divided by 4 is 7, 7 times 7, 49 to 1. So there's different ways you could wind a 49 to 1 or a 64 to 1, different combinations of wire. So if we look at the uh, if we look at the NFED half-wave transformer in a little bit more detail, I just want to run through the components here. Um, so we've got a, a diagram and, and the real thing here. So we have enamel copper wire or magnet wire more commonly known as here, that we use to basically wrap around our transformer or transformers if they are stacked. Um, we have a ferrite core. Um, typically, we use uh, 43 material, but there is uh, various different types of uh, cores and materials out there. We've got primary windings, which are highlighted here in green. They, you can see that they go no further. They just go between the earth or the, the shield and um, the... Uh, center conductor. We've got the secondary windings in red. Um, and then we've got a capacitor here. Now, the capacitors, I think I think it's actually some of the most interesting part of the NFED half wave. Um, and in quite simple speak, the capacitor simply improves your SWR on uh, bands above 20 meters. So it lowers the SWR and it also, so then it gives you a wider bandwidth. So you're able to say get most of 10 meters. And um, so in simple terms, that's what it does. It also plays an important job in actually making the transformer more efficient. So without it, you've got a bit more of a lossy transformer where we get the, the um, transformer heating up a bit. Um, and from there, we have a, an RF connector back to the radio. That could be a SO239. It could be a BNC, etc., etc. And you'll notice that we've effectively got a short, uh, so a short at direct current. Um, so if basically, if you put a multimeter uh, across it, you would see a short at DC. But because radio frequency RF is AC, the, the antenna, it doesn't see that. So I'm going to talk about some of the, the basic components for the NFED half wave. Um, so these are ones that I've actually used personally. Um, you may see some suppliers here, some names, but you know you could pick your own. But um, these are just examples that I found. So you don't need to go too big with your wire. Um, so typically when I'm making sort of my 100 watt NFED half wave, I'm using wire that's around about one millimeter in diameter, I think. I've got 1.12 here. I've also used 1.16. You can go bigger, but it's just sore or sore on your hands to actually wind. Um, and you can go with a much smaller wire. I use a 0.63 uh, millimeter wire, and this is lovely for like say small QRP cores. But you could go bigger or go smaller depending on your application. And there's some sort of uh, things here recommended. Now. Um, Looking at um, the cores, the ferrite cores, and these are by and far the most popular cores that we use uh, in the NFED half wave. Excuse me. 
Uh, on the left hand side here we have a um, an FT14043. So the 140 stands for 1.4 of an inch and the 43 stands for the, mat the material. You need to look at the data sheet to see what the composition is. And I've got the sizes there as well as the, the part numbers. So uh, as I believe, it's only a company called Fairwrite that actually make these cores. Um, Sometimes they're, they're branded as Amidon. I think it's Amidon, yes, but they're all made by Fairwrite. On the right-hand side here, we have a, the FT24043, which is typically for running higher power. Um, um, and that's 2.4 inches. So generally speaking, this is what we see and what people use. <clears throat> now, I spoke earlier about the capacitor. And this is the one that I actually seen recommended and I would recommend it to, uh, to you to use. And I use this on all my NFED half waves that I build, whether they're QRP or they're running um, a couple of hundred watts. Um, this TDK capacitor is the one that I would recommend. Um, there's two of them actually. One has got short legs, one's got longer legs. It doesn't matter which one, which one you get because you've got to trim uh, the legs anyway. Uh, just a word of warning that um, you see a lot of no-name capacitors on uh, eBay um, and oh, and places like that, a market online marketplaces. So I would always go for a branded type uh, a, a capacitor. Um, and I should have mentioned earlier, but the spec of this is a hundred picofarad. So that's what I found that works for me. <clears throat> Typically, you'll see people using um, so uh, hundred, or they may use two 220 picofarad uh, capacitors um, uh, in series, I think that, yeah, and that basically then that gives you 110, so around about 100 picofarad, but that, that, that can vary depending on the application. So wire for your NFED half wave, um, there's lots of choices, I'm going to give you three here, uh, I'm a big fan of this SOTA beams wire, um, it's very lightweight, I use it for a number of antennas, um, it's cross-sectional, it's 0.22 millimeter. It can be a little bit fiddly to work with, um, just you've got to be careful with it when you're stripping it. Um, it it's good for over just over 100 watts. Um, I think SOTA beams rate it to 150 watts at a 1 to 1 SWR. So it's really nice and lightweight, so it's ideal for your uh, for the SOTA people, the people that want to do a little bit of walking, hiking, whatever. But um, it's not great uh, under tension, so uh, for a, for a home installation, if you want to put a little bit of tension, it's probably not the choice to go for. The middle ground, um, and I typically go with this wire uh, quite a lot. Uh, this is tri-rated cable, um, and it's very common to buy from uh, electrical wholesalers, suppliers. You can find it online, and you'd e I've no doubt you'd even uh, find it locally. So this is good up to around about a kilowatt. Um, and so this is 0.75 millimeter wire, um, and I buy it at 100 meter spools. It's about, uh, I think it's, I think off the top of my head, it's about 15 pounds for for 100 meters. So it's really quite good value. Again, you can't put massive stretch on it, but you can put a little bit into it. Um, if you really want to go heavy duty, um, there is there is a number of kind of military style Kevlar core wires. Um, and this is one that I've actually used myself personally when I purchased some antennas a lo lo long time ago. So it's a, it's like a, it looks like th the outs, this wire actually looks like shield of co like the shielding of a coax. It looks like a tin copper, but I think it's maybe even silver coated, and it has a, a Kevlar a center going through the middle of it. It's extremely strong. So maybe if you want to put up like a, a flat top or something, something with a lot of tension, this would be the wire to go from. Um, but <clears throat> by the time you get it, it's about a pound a meter. Now, the reason why I actually got into NFED half waves is I came across a video on YouTube. Um, it's a channel called Evil Layer Electronics. And they were showing a couple of couple of transformers, and uh, they were saying that they were a lot better and a lot less lossy uh, than some of the some of the ones that we were currently using. So that's that's what got me into it. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about next. And this is actually just a selection of some of the cores that I've actually checked here. Um, if I could have kept them all wound, I would have done so. But I basically run out of cores, um, and I couldn't keep buying more. Couldn't afford to keep buying it more. Right. So you may be wondering why we would actually want to check uh, the loss in a transformer. So 
again, one of the things you hear people talking about is their transformer actually heating up and their SWR going high. Um, and that's because they're getting some losses in the transformer and eventually the, the ferrite cores actually heat up. Uh, they lose their properties and then the, the transformer stops working. So in front of you here is a method, uh, I think it's basically known as the back-to-back -back method, and it's a way of checking uh, transformer efficiency. Uh, the good thing about this method is um, it doesn't matter the type of transformer, it could be a 4 to 1, a 9 to 1, uh, 4 to 9 to 1, it doesn't matter. Um, you basically use, I'm using, I, I use my Nano VNA and it's a very cheap one. Uh, I purchased it back in 2018 or 2019, 2.8 inch screen and, and it's done me great guns so uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money here. So the block diagram on, on the left here, you've got your, your VNA. So basically uh, you take um, signal out one and then you put it through a transformer. So this would be the high side, yeah, the high side of the transformer, and then you feed it into the high side of another transformer, and these have to be identical. Um, this is probably the downside uh, of, of this form of testing is that you need two identical transformers. So you so you hook the two high, high sides together. You then take out the low side and you put it back into the, the, the VNA. So you could maybe just about see this yellow curve uh, on, on the VNA here, and you'll actually get a negative value on your uh, uh, VNA or Vector Network Analyzer, and this is basically telling you the losses. Now, because you're checking across two transformers, you then need to half your losses, so you need to bear that in mind. Uh, there is another method um, to, to do this. i actually seen a video for that um, just a couple of weeks ago there. I can't remember the the the, uh, the call sign who, who, who the, of the of the radio amateur, but um, people have done some tests and it actually the, the comparison actually ties in with the back to back test. So it doesn't really matter which one that you do, as long as you've got a valid method. Right. So the Fairlight FT one forty forty three, which we looked at earlier, again um, looking at losses of that. So on the left hand side here, this was uh, what I actually uh, checked very, very, this is the first comparison, the first check that I did. And this is probably the most common NFED uh, transformer um, winding style. And after checking with the Nano VNA, you could see that our efficiencies here. Uh, on the face of it, they look terrible, but th they're not that bad. Um, so you could see that across HF that we are basically, we're just less than 70%, but it's pretty even. The reason why I have not applicable on 80 meters on some of these is quite simply, I didn't check 80 meters. Um, I should have checked that, but at, that, at the time I wasn't interested in 80, but I really should have checked. I then tried some uh, other windings. So I looked at, um, the descriptions are here. So instead of the windings uh, spaced out, I had them clo uh, close together. You can see that improved things. I then tried a different type of 49 to 1, so a, 20, a 3 primary, uh, 21 secondary. That improved things on the lower bands, but you can see it starts to fall off a cliff uh, on 10 meters. And I then tried, I actually struggled to fit all this wire on, but a, a 4 turn primary, 28 turn secondary, um, and you can actually see what it's done. So for 80 meters and 40 meters, and even 20 meters, it would actually make a very good um, NFED half-wave transformer. But look what happens by the time you get to 10 meters, you're losing. You know, you put 100 watts, uh, your coax, you're only getting um, 80 coming out at the other end of the transformer. So um, we can do better, I think. Looking at the 240-43, I didn't do a lot of testing on this, um, but Looking on the left-hand side here, again, this is your typical NFED half-wave, and it's actually not too shabby at all. So for people that are running your kind of 100 watts uh, SSB or CW, it's not too bad at all. You can see that I've got the key here, the key here, um, but it's just what you want to to make that. So again, we're 
we're, we're, we're over 75%. 2015, we're up to 82. 10 metres, you know, we're 78. So it's not actually that bad. Um, a lot of people like to run more power, obviously, than 100 watts. Um, and that can be a little bit of an issue on the NFED half level. I'm not going to cover that tonight. Uh, but if you basically take three of your 240, 43 cores and you stack them, um, you can basically have a greater power handling. So, like you could see here, so from 160 through 20, it's actually a very efficient uh, transformer. You won't actually get much better than these figures. 90% is roughly where it, it, it can top out or where I've seen efficiency topping out. But if you look again on 10 metres, you can see that the the performance again starts to fall off a cliff. Not terrible, but starts to certainly fall off. Um, and this may or may not add to the, the poor performance thing on 10 metres, but I think that's probably more to do with uh, 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 the radiation pattern. So, can we do any better? And I think that we can. So, the video or the, the YouTube channel that I mentioned earlier, so Evil Layer Electronics, uh, actually had these two cores. Um, and I actually purchased these cores before I did any testing. So for the small core on the left here, the 2643-625-002. So, and then on the right, the 2643-251-002. Now, the, this chunk here on the right here, there's only a couple of grams difference in weight from a 240-43. But so it's, it's actually much the same mass. But if you look at these, you can see that they're much chunkier, so they're taller. Um, so basically, the ratio of the height to width is is a little bit different uh, from the 140-43 and the 240-43, and I think this is why they're actually somewhat better. This is the uh, little QRP core here, uh, the 5002 core. Um, and initially, I thought I'd actually want to watch because the first time I actually checked this, we were up over 90% efficiency. And I actually seen Evil Lair, he'd actually done this, so I thought, well, I don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'll, I'll just go with that. I checked it, and we had these really good low losses. But unfortunately, when I actually tried to set it up as an antenna, uh, I could not get a low SWR on 40 meters. Um, it wouldn't go, when I set up the antenna, either inverted V or invent, inverted L, my chosen uh, preference, the SWR wouldn't go below, say, I was like 2.3, 2.4 to 1, which was really frustrating. And I won't go into detail, but I tried a number of things. I had a lot of people help, try to help me do this, do that. Nothing really worked. So I started playing about with um, some other windings, which you could see here. This Winding here is really quite interesting. I actually stacked two of these little cores together um, and you could see that it made it very efficient on 80 metres and 40 metres, but again, on the higher frequencies, it fell off a cliff. On the right-hand side here, this 64 to 1 winding, this is actually the winding that I actually used for my finished NFED half-wave. Um, and again, it wasn't because it was the most efficient. It was that compromise that I could actually get a low SWR um, uh, with the with the transformer. So I wish I could have went with this one, but unfortunately, I had to take that little bit of a hit. But we're still good. We're still, you know, pretty consistent. You know, and I'm using it 40 meters up, so I'm still over 82% for, for all the bands. So I'm quite happy with that, and it turned out a great little uh, transformer. This is probably the core that most people will be interested in. So this is the 1002 core, more comparable with the 240-43. And you can actually get basically the highest efficiency that I've actually seen from a from, from a transformer. I won't go through uh, all of these, but um, you can see all the uh, different configurations that I've done. Um, I even did a, a seven-turn... A second, so yeah, one term primary and a seven term secondary, and you can see how bad it was. But um, again, I had the same problem that I had with the um, little QRP core, is that when I actually went with this winding here, um, I, I couldn't get a low SWR on 40 meters. 
Um, and I'm not quite sure why a 49 to 1 wouldn't work. Um, but what I ended up doing was somebody suggested they say put an extra turn on your secondary. And that's what I did. So two turns primary, 15 turns secondary, which then turned it into 56 and a bit something to 1. So I just call it the 56 to 1. And what that did was it really didn't change the efficiency over the 49 to 1. It really maybe even improved some of it. Um, but what I actually did was I actually brought down the SWR. So it's actually below 2 to 1 as an inverted L in 40 metres, and it's below 1.5 to 1 uh, as an inverted V. So it, it, it more than good enough. And basically, this is this is probably my favourite NFED half wave. So, and I've seen a lot of people uh, actually doing this as well. Well, seen a lot of videos, a lot on social media. A lot of people seem to be going for this now, and they seem to be sticking with the, the, the 56 to 1 transformer. So we have our uh, efficient cores, or sorry, more efficient cores. I, I guess uh, I guess some people may th may not think it's maybe not worth a while, but I certainly think it's worthwhile getting uh, as much as we can uh, uh, from these uh, ferrite cores transformers. So the QRP core, I then turned it into this little NFED half wave, and I've got the one dollar note for comparison. Um, and it's a really cute little thing. I managed to find a little Hammond 1551 enclosure, which was almost perfect for it. Um, you can see these marks inside the case. I had to take my Dremel and actually basically remove some of the material from here um, and also from the matching lid so I could get the, the lid to fit flush. But this only weighs about 50 grams, 55 grams. Um, and it's not expensive to build. Um, it's maybe... £12, something like that, for the parts alone. The problem that you'll actually have is postage and packaging for the parts. So this is, obviously, I use this 063 millimeter wire, the core, the same TDK capacitor, the, the enclosure that I mentioned. Um, I use M4 stainless steel hardware. Um, I typically use 304 grade stainless steel, um, and I find that more than good enough for me. You can go with 316 which is marine grade, but unless you're by the sea, I wouldn't bother. It's not worth the extra price. And I go with a, an Amphenol BNC, and I can actually buy most of this stuff from, it's usually DigiKey I buy it from, and I can buy the BNC, I can buy the enclosure, I can buy the capacitor, I can buy the little ferrite core, um, all from uh, a DigiKey. Um, but I think you've got to spend about £35 plus VAT, but say you're a few, a few friends or a club, you could actually group, do this as a club buy, which would make it quite an, an inexpensive build. Um, looking at the bigger NFED half wave. Now, I was going to go into this presentation how to wind the, the transformers and stuff, but there's there's a lot of people out there that could explain this better than me. <clears throat> so I thought it was better just showing you the components that I've actually been using um, um, to build these transformers. So I've used the 1.12 uh, uh, in millimeter enamel copper wire. The 1002 core, um, same TDK capacitor, an RP1044 enclosure. I've used bigger stainless steel hardware, M6. Typically, I use M6 for anything other than the QRP small stuff. This yellow board in here, this was a little project in itself. I'd never designed anything in uh, printed circuit board material, so I had some people help me. So it's just a plain board, but I had it, I had it made by a Chinese PCB company, these blank boards. I had the holes put in them as part of that uh, manufacture, and I was able to just basically cable tie the core to this. You don't need that. That's entirely optional, um, but it was just a nice little side project for me. And uh, this has an SO239 on it. And I, I, I favour the uh, uh, on eBay M zero MET. He has some good, um, good value and good quality RF connectors. Now, something I've not covered is power handling, and this is quite. Uh, this could be quite a what would, it, what would we call it? Uh, uh, evocative or not? Not evocative is not the word. Uh, contentious subject <laughs> here um, with power handling and what different NFED half-wave transformers can actually handle. Now, I've, I've actually done some tests, and I've actually done some, you know, sort of, I would call full-duty cycle tests, so predominantly FT8. So these three on the left here, the 140, 43, 
Oh, a little typo here. My mistake. This should be a 240-43 and the 1002 core. So I actually ran these on FT8 and I ran them continually on FT8 until the, the SWR just started to rise. So that was when the core reached reached saturation point or something called curry point, curry point, um, when it lost its properties. So what I found was the 140-43, around about 30 watts. If you run 30 watts in uh, an FT8 for long enough, so you're, what is it, 16 seconds on, 16 seconds off, whatever it may be, you, you'll start to, uh, any more than that, and you'll start to have the SWR rise. On the 240-43, I found that figure to be about 70 watts. Again, if you're running SSB, you run 100 watts, no problem on it, but it will depend, you know, it will depend on a number of factors, compression, so on and so on, the length of your over, length of your transmission. Now, the 1002 core, um, this will handle 100 watts uh, FT8 for hours and hours on end. Um, now, I know that FT8 is not a, is, is meant to be a, it's a low signal mode, it's not a low power mode, um, but I actually had the opportunity to, to run 100 watts FT8 during, a, a, it was a contest. So for four hours uh, continuously, I run FT8, 100 watts. Um, I actually didn't use my radio for this, I should point out. I use my radio to drive my amplifier. Because it's not good running your radio, radio that kind of power uh, on, on full duty cycle for long periods of time. But this, 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 this uh, core handled the 100 watts, no problem. And on the 5002 uh, uh, QRP core, I haven't done any FD8 on it, but I have done a lot of CW, and it will hand, handle uh, 10 watts of CW, no problem at all. So, you know, it's going to handle that, um, you know, maybe 20 watts of SSB uh, quite happily. Just a couple of pictures here. I, I don't actually have that many pictures of actually setups. Um, so the left-hand picture and the middle picture here, uh, I went on holiday last year. I went up to the north of Scotland. So this is uh, uh, near Dornoch. And this was actually the very first outing with this little QRP transformer. And my first contact was actually into Brazil. Now, probably more to do with the salt water than anything, but it was actually a thrill to actually work Brazil right off the bat with this transformer. And then I worked another station in Brazil right at the back of it on 20 metres. So I actually had it set up as an inverted L. So I had some, these are actually sand uh, sand stakes. So I had my 10 metre spider beam pole and it, it was a kind of inverted L. On the right hand side here, it's, it's, again, it's hard to see, but this has got the, the 100 watt end fed half wave. This is on a 12 metre spider beam pole, and you can see there's a bit of a kink in it here. And this basically runs down here, uh, and I'm running it uh, uh, as an inverted L. Now, um, you could use a number of supports to get your end fed half wave up. If you're at home, as I say, you could put it on the end of your house, whatever. Um, but I am a big fan of a spider beam. Uh, mass poles. Um, I, I held off for a long time before I actually purchased these, um, but, but now that I've actually got one and I've actually got the 12 and the 10 meter, I found that they're, they're excellent poles. They're very heavy duty. Um, and if you happen to break a section, you can actually replace one of these. So um, certainly worth the money. If you're able to save up for one of these, I would certainly recommend the spider beam poles. For, for, for any, um, actually, any sort of amateur radio application for that matter. So, there we go. So, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, I've probably not covered everything I wanted to cover. Um, and if you've got any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Back to you, David. Thank you very much, Colin. <clears throat> yes, we've certainly got a few comments and questions for you, so that's no danger. And I, uh, do take the opportunity to have a, a quick drink as well. Uh, lovely presentation complex subject but we're, as you know we're aiming this for beginners so there may be terms if you're watching this that you don't understand or anything and that's what this is all about so please don't be afraid to ask that or any other questions or comments if you haven't already asked them please ask them now and don't forget your name and a call sign if you have one as well on each message and i'll try and read as many of those as i can to colin um colin i mean the nfed half wave as you say it's, it sometimes has mixed reviews i use one personally and i think it's really good all-round antenna and and ideal for people who maybe as, as well have we've got who are in areas where um, a mast and, and formal antennas just wouldn't really work. Is this a sort of your go-to antenna now? 
It, yes, certainly, it's certainly on my list for working portable. Um, so when I was first I was first licensed, I still stayed at home, um, at home with my mum and dad, and they had a quite a big garden, so um, I, I was able to put up quite a lot of different antennas. But where I live now, you know, it's your typical suburban garden, so it's very difficult to to, to put up you know big antennas beams or anything so i, I do enjoy putting up the nfed half wave um i quite running it because of where we are in the solar cycle um i like running it and because i have a young daughter as well i can't have permanent setups all the time um so basically i'll quite often i'll go and set up my spider beam pole in the garden i'll set up maybe five minutes and um, i'll put the nfed half wave up it and then i'll operate for a couple of hours um, and in five minutes to take it down again. So it, it's quite a versatile antenna, um, but y you can just use it for, you know, any band you want. So you don't need to put up this, you know, even like the full 66 feet or, or uh, uh, even double that for 80 metres, the big long length of wire. If you just want to run, say, 10 metres, for example, great time to be running 10 metres. You, you could just do that with a with a halfway for 10 metres, which is which is not a, not a big piece of wire. Yeah, indeed. And... Uh... Dare I say, if you choose the colour of the wire carefully as well, it can be even more disguised and in the background, can't it? Um, let's, uh, let's read some of the questions and comments to you. Firstly, um, uh, for the first one's from Paul Green. Is there any advice on how you tie off the antenna wire at the end? Uh, in other words, do you expose the inner wire when trying tying to a dog bone, which is one of the insulator types? Is there any hints appreciated, he says? You, you can try. I, I tend not to worry too much about that. Um, ideally, if you can, yes. But normally, I just tie off a knot. I don't actually. I was looking to see what I have one handy here. But normally, um, I was looking for my soda beams wire. But yeah, so there, there, there's some of this wire here. But normally, I just tie it off in a knot. I don't worry about it too much. Um, typically, I'm working portable, so it's never out in the elements for for that long. Um, Something that's quite good is something called uh, liquid electrical tape. Um, and you could take a little dab of this stuff and just put it on here and it'll basically suck in and basically seal up uh, the wire. Um, or you could use a little bit of uh, adhesive or glue lined heat shrink, a little bit of that over the end um, so it doesn't feel it and just basically squeeze it and you can seal your wire off like that. So there, there's a couple of ways you can do it, but I, I don't worry too much about it if I'm perfectly honest. So not really critical. You can just tie a knot at the no. end of the day. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the by the way one of the wonderful things about this is we're all used to seeing quite amazing rigs and things that we don't probably stand much of a chance of building. But antennas, of course, is one of those things that most of us can build, as you're showing us tonight. Um, and uh, you yeah. know, I'm always telling people that you know you, you tend to think about the radio and the mic and, and things because that's the bits you see in the shack. But actually, the bit that's up in the air is probably the most important part of your radio station. Would you agree? Oh, I, I, absolutely. Um, you know, I, yeah, I, I, I fully agree, and I, I don't, I don't have a lot of, I, I haven't personally invested in a lot of big radios. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think it's always better. I mean, I, I look about my garage here. Um, so for sort of the last five years, I've, I would say I've went to say that as far as ob, as I've obsessed in building antennas, and it's just a thoroughly enjoyable subject. And as I say, I'm not someone that comes from a, an electronics or a radio or an RF background. So it's really something that, that anyone can do. Yeah, um, and absolutely. And again, I, I touched on it there. You know, where we are in the solar cycle, you don't need to put up anything too extravagant to, to really work the world. Good, good advice. Uh, Paul Temple has asked a question. Any tips for keeping the SWR dip mid-band across 40 metres to 10 metres? When I cut for phone segment on 40 meters, I get dips on higher bands moving progressively away from mid, even with a capacitor, he says. Yes, the, 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 this, can, this can be an issue. Um, I, I, wasn't going to, I don't have a massive experience this, but I have, I have experienced. It's all about looking for a happy medium. Um, so depending what type of radio that you're using, um, typically if I see an SWR of 2 to 1 or below, I, I tend not to worry. I, an SWR of 2 to 1 is 11% loss. So I, I really don't worry. I used to be uh, pedantic about it and try to get it as low as possible. But unfortunately, you can't do too much. What some people uh, do do is so 
uh, say you have your transformer, say two or three meters from the transformer up, some people actually put a brake in there and actually put a, they can put a, a capacitor in there or they can put an inductor there, so a little coil of, coil of wire, a few turns of wire. So you could try that. I'm not sure, I can't remember off the top of my head which way it needs to go. So say two meters up from each transformer, if you wind, say, three or four turns, um, a little coil, what that will do is that that will actually shift that um, uh, SWR dip and it shouldn't really affect the higher bands. So that's one way that you could actually look at perhaps uh, moving that. Um, but again, it, it just depends. Uh, all cores and all infrared half waves can be different, just, just depending. Um, but th there's things you can do. Outside. I'm not an expert on that, but certainly a capacitor, or a or a, a little coil or an inductor just close to the the transformer can sometimes work just yeah. to shift that. Yeah, just experiment then with that. Thanks. Uh, over on BATC now, uh, Peter G8 uh, CKB. Firstly, he made a comment, um, and I'm just going to try and address that. He, he said, "I'd take you to task over the chokes that you credit to GM3 SEK." He repeated, introduced himself, introduced them to Radcom readers, but they come from an article published by Chuck W. One HIS. Well, this isn't really a criticism of you, and obviously Ian isn't here to defend himself either. So I just thought I'd better mention it though, because uh, uh, Peter has, has brought it up. And I, I mean, one of the difficulties, I guess, with all this sort of thing is who invented the who's what first. But but anyway, yeah. acknowledging what you say, Peter, and I'm sure that um, if you were to contact yep. um, Ian G M three S E K, then uh, he'll address it. But anyway, he comes back on something else as well. He asks, why you do you use a three kilovolt capacitor? Because he says 500 volts is more than enough in a 500, uh, sorry, a 50 ohm system. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, it's just because that's what was easiest to get hold of, and I haven't done a lot of experimenting myself. I'm honest with you with with capacitors. So I've seen seen other people testing these TDKs. Um, they're very very cheap. They're easy to get a hold of. So just quite as simple as that. But he's he's absolutely right. Um, 3 kV is is actually overkill 500 volts would be more than enough and uh, if you can get a, a, a decent um, branded capacitor 500 volts that would be more than ample sure although i guess it's good to have a bit of headroom with these things and um, as you say that they are some capacitors which aren't labeled um, i tend to use branded ones as well and i think the last time i bought something like this for an enfed halfway that the club did earlier this year was about 40p something like that so it's not a huge cost really these these cores no. uh, i want to talk to you about because um i must admit i've tended to stick to the ferrite ones the ones you've mentioned the 240 and 43 um that uh, g0kya who you also mentioned earlier he's a member of our club and steve um tends to use that there really is a mixture and one other one tip if i like to might you don't mind me sharing with everybody watching as well is that when you get a collection of these things it's very important to label them when you get them because otherwise you won't know what they all do and they all look the same unless you've got some very specialized test gear i guess you'd never know how to identify them do you agree with that uh, absolutely and i actually have some um, they're not mine i need to send them back but i had them sent labeled to me so i have some ft 240 43s um and they've actually labeled 43 but i also have uh, ft 240 52s and these are absolutely identical. Um, so if they weren't labelled up, you're absolutely yeah. right. Um, yeah. So I, I'm lucky that I don't have like the 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 cores that I recommend. Uh, these are the only ones I have, so I won't mix them up. But certainly the 140 and the 240 size is very easy to do that. Yeah. Just a little tip, anyway. Uh, Ian Munro comes and asks a question now. A winding ma impedance matching transformer, which you covered earlier on in the talk. As the wire is wound from the bottom of the diagram, turns progress clockwise around the core. After the wires cross over, wire crosses over, why are turns added anti-clockwise? It, it, it can actually, a lot of people do this basically to suit where you actually want to have your antenna point connection. You could just wind the wire continually around the core if you want to. Um, I've done on the experiments I've done, they call that the crossover. So it doesn't really matter as long as it goes through it. But um, I, as I say, I've, I've done both. It, you can do it either way, but depending on your um, on your on your transformer and what you end up with, you can see that I've got my antenna connection here. So I don't actually have a crossover here. You can see that I've just started winding and it just goes all the one way. But say I had the antenna connection on the on the top here, if I put in the crossover, I could then bring it up here. 
Um, and with this core, it wouldn't actually make any difference to the efficiency of the core um, if I did the crossover or not. So a lot of it can be down to personal preference. Yes, and um, in fact, G0FVT came back um, to Ian as well and just said that he, he reckons that uh, to continue the, the same way, but the crossover is there to reduce the effects of end capacitance, which must make a difference as well. Yep, yep. Um, as I say, I, this this is this is where it almost uh, uh, it gets me a little bit stuck because I have a, a, an electronics background here, um, but that's 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 certainly how I understand it there, and I think that's also part of the the the, uh, the what the capacitor does, and I think it it kind of uh, counteracts some of the the leakage inductance there that, that can be in with in in with the uh, transformer. Mm -hmm. Now earlier on, you mentioned the use of a, a nano VNA to do the testing, and. I'm sure many of the beginners watching this in particular may not have heard of one, or if they have, they wouldn't know how to use one or whatever. I yeah. thought I'd just look it up because I know that um, on Tonight at Eight, a couple of years ago, we actually did a, a talk about the Nano VNA. It's a very useful bit of test equipment, but it can be a bit daunting. It's only about 50 pounds or so, roughly, isn't it? But it can be a bit yeah. daunting to you. Yeah. So if I may, I'm just going to mention that um, if you want to look back at the Tonight at Eight webinars page of the RSGB, and we'll give you the link at the end, um, and have a look at the 12th of April, 2021, and we covered a talk by Alan Wolke um, all about how to use the Nano VNA because it is a really useful bit of equipment, not just to test the SWRs, but other effectiveness as well of transformers, isn't it? It, it, it can do far more than probably what I'm actually going to do with it. But I, I, I've been amazed what I can do with the, the Nano VNA. But what I think it does have a, a very sharp learning curve with it. But because there's so many of them. Uh, out there, there's, there's there's videos galore on YouTube, and that, I, I'm 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 very much a visual learner. So once you get the basics with the the, the nano VNA and the critical thing, what I found is uh, I think you need, you need to do is you need to ensure that it's calibrated correctly, and it's calibrated correctly at the point of use. So if you have a little bit of coax on there, you need to make sure that it's calibrated at that point with the, the open, short, and load. Um, but it could it could do so much the nano VNA. Um, it mine, as I say, mine was quite a, an early one, but I was able to update the firmware in it, which brought it up to date. Um, even with that tiny 2.8 inch screen, you know, I could hook it up to the computer. Um, but yeah, I, I can't say any more than that. It's a fabulous little bit of kit, and it's certainly well worth buying, even if you don't use it or don't use it a lot. Um, there will come there will come a point where you, you say, "Oh, I could actually check that," or "Or I wonder if I can do that," and then you've got the you've got it there to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a, a message now or a question, which I think you partly covered. I'm just trying to find it now. It was a, I'm afraid I don't have a call sign. And the name on the YouTube account is Squeaky Toy Killer and me. Anyway, the question was, <laughs> is stranded copper wire better or, or one solid core better? I know you were quoting stranded 702 ones earlier. What do you think is best for antenna yeah. wires like this? Um, I, I think it, it's got to suit your uh, suit your application. Um, personally, I like to use a stranded just because it's more flexible. Um, but RF actually, tra RF. I mean, that's, I suppose that's one of the funny things for RF. And I, I, I didn't. I only learned this not too long ago that RF uh, only throws on the outside of the wire and not through it. Um, but it comes down to personal preference. I do have um, what they call hard drawn. I'm looking about hard drawn copper wire, which is basically this magnet wire, and it was like pre-stretched wire. And I used that for a number of years, and that was an excellent antenna wire. So it really suits the application. But for me, I'm working portable, even at home here, effectively, I'm working portable. So I'm putting antennas up, putting them down. And when you have a solid wire, um, it's not conducive to bending. <laughs> so uh, if it's for a, for a for a permanent installation, it's good. Um, but if you need that flexibility in the wire, it's, 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 it's as I say, it's not so good. Stranded a bit better, okay. Um, a useful tip here from Paul Temple, who says that Fairlight, which is the manufacturer of the toroids, um, they have a video on identifying toroids, so that, that might be very helpful if you've got a, a wow. box of these. I mean, I often see yep. them at rallies, don't you? You often see radio rallies with boxes Absolutely. of toroids and no identification on them, but be, be aware yeah, they're not all the and same. I think, I, and, I th and I think that's something that you've got to be aware of, even when you're buying them. I think, you know, it, it, sometimes it's difficult to know what you're actually buying because... Really, if we were buying a 240, 43, is it 43? Is it 31 material? Is it 52? You know, we've, we've just got to trust them. Um, but um, it's another 
good thing if 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 you can afford it and you could maybe even get from some of the some of the companies you know basically you know what you're getting and maybe you could club together as i see i, I typically buy from digikey so i basically save my pennies for a few months and i, I basically get the order over 35 pounds plus the vat which is nearing up near 50 and i i put in an order that way at least then i kind of a bit more sure of i'm knowing what i'm getting yeah as you say or, or club together with some of your friends or, yep. or neighbors at the club um, Tim G five TM asks: Would the hundred watt transformer on FTA cope with the currently legal limit of four hundred watts SSB? Uh, I don't think so. No. Um, I, I, I um, when I did that test, I actually went out and actually was was checking the transformer, and it did get quite warm. So, I, I, in short, I I can't give a concrete answer to Tim, but um, no, I don't think so. I think we would need to go with something else and. <clears throat> that is uh, the uh, the problem with NFED half leaves is for running a QRO running running high high power. Um, there there isn't a, a core like this one zero zero two core which is great and nice and efficient right across HF. There doesn't seem to be a core existing for the same for running higher power. Um, obviously, us as radio amateurs are relying on uh, commercially for these cores being available. Um, but yeah, maybe someday we'll discover one or they'll dis discover a combination of cores. Um, if you just want it for like a spot frequency, uh, I think that would be easy enough to do. But um, certainly not, you won't find one that's efficient all the way across HF or 90% efficient all the way across HF. Um, but uh, perhaps someday we'll discover something. Yeah. Um, uh, G0FET says that PTFE insulated wire is good for RF work because it has the conductors silver plated generally. Um, yep. And uh, AD, G6AD asks a question, do you prefer the NFED half wave over the adjuster wave, Colin? That's a new one on me, adjuster uh, wave. I hope you know what that is. Yeah, that was an antenna that I came up with a, a long, long time ago. That um, It basically is just a variable length uh, quarter wave that it was on, a, on fishing reels that I can adjust in and out, and I actually can do that. <clears throat> with here, I'll just actually, just I'll grab it. Oh. I love the name, by the way, Adjuster Wave. <laughs> Patent bending so, almost, I think. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> as I say, it's for anyone. anyone. So what you're actually looking at here is the 100 watt NFED half wave, and you can see there's a fly fishing reel here uh, with wire mm. on it, and basically there's a reel here uh, on the other side. So basically I run it up to a pulley and back down it again. So I can basically just adjust this for whatever frequency I want to operate on. I love um, it. I love it. <laughs> so is fishing uh, another hobby of yours by any chance? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, fun, funnily, fun, funnily enough, <laughs> that was how I was able to, to basically source those. But uh, answer to Ad, Addy's question. So um, in simple terms, yes, because I think that a half wave beats a quarter wave and it has the benefit of not needing radials. But it's horses for courses, and it depends what sort of convenience that you want. But if you said, give me a, an adjusted wave on 20 metres or give me an NFED half wave on 20 metres, I would take the NFED half wave. Right, and there we are. And that's a, probably a good point to end. I think we've covered most of the questions from people. Lots of lovely compliments for you. You'll be able to look at them yourself, Colin, as well on YouTube afterwards and on BATC. I'll just pick a couple out. Steve M1 at STH says, a great summary, Colin. Uh, yeah, NFED half wave is my favourite for portable, quick and easy to set up in a park and summit. And Graham G8 NWC says great presentation on a popular antenna for many, used for many portable operations, and can definitely recommend Colin's little QRP version and a great project for a club construction project. Absolutely, Colin, thank you very much indeed for tonight's talk. I'm sure you've inspired you. many people to give it a go. Antennas is definitely something that you can make yourself, and this is not something that's going to cost a fortune either. Um, and something maybe uh, ideal to make on these uh, cold winter evenings. Thank you very much indeed for today. Definitely. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank Cheers. you. There we are. And that does end this webinar. And thanks once again to Colin Summers, MM0 OPX. And thanks also to the team who helped put the series together behind the scenes. The RSGB annual construction competition is now underway and incidentally includes a category for beginners. The competition is judged online, so you don't need to send your projects away, and you have until the 1st of March 2024 to enter. For full details, visit rsgb.org forward slash construction dash competition, or see the latest RADCOM for more information. 
And next month's Tonight at 8 webinar will be focusing on amateur radio construction and the construction competition. So I hope you'll be able to join us for that. And if you'd like to see details of our future webinars or watch recordings of previous programs in the series, please visit rsgb.org forward slash webinars, where you can also send us comments and feedback. And if you subscribe to the RSGB's YouTube channel, you'll be notified of all upcoming Tonight at 8 webinars, as well as other new videos and presentations from the Society on a wide range of amateur radio topics. Until next time, this is David G7RP, signing off and clear. Bye-bye.